everyone. My name is Otas um, for RISE. Welcome to our first uh, RISE Office Hours. Um, RISE Office Hours is really just an opportunity for our, um, everyone really to meet with us and hang out with the team and just kind of get to know us and ask any questions about what we do and who we are and really any other thing that has popped up on your mind that you just haven't had a chance to approach um, with us and people who are going to be speaking for majority of this meeting is AK, our CEO, and Bosu and Tony, our co-founders. AK, you're muted. They're I, AK. And Tony and Bosu are our co-founders. But first, um, before we get started, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can ask us any questions and someone from the team will respond to it. We're also going to start a poll right you can um we're going to start a poll right now and you can just allow um answer the questions as you see fit it's started whenever you guys are ready thank you thank you very much Otaz, for the introduction hi everybody my name is ak and my co-founders tony and boss are on the call with me um it's a pleasure to hang out with you all Hi, uh, my name is Boston Olayo Raju, and I at the engineering department. So basically, um, I oversee product development and all the things you see in the in, in the Rice app. And it's a pleasure to be here. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tony, and um, I oversee operations and data analytics at um, Rice and. We'll talk a bit about that um, when, you know, it's time. Awesome. So just so we can jump into the next thing, um, Bosso, who we call at Rise HQ, we call him the Oracle. So he's just going to talk about our products, you know, product development, how we think about and make decisions about product. And so, um, B. All right. Um, so um, it's nice to be here. Um, so what do you guys see on the, on the Rise app that you guys interact with? Basically, we are the faces behind um, everything at Rise. So the engineering department is um, responsible for developing the application, basically. And the, the team um, comprises of um, three developers, one designer, and um, one product manager. And then I basically just um, sit on top of everything. Uh, so the approach we use at Rise to develop our products is um, agile methodology. And what that gives us is that it lets us um, introduce features into the product incrementally so that we don't wait until we deliver every single thing that we need in the product before users get the chance to, to, to play around with it or to use it. So we, we look into um, all the things that we want, we want to have done. And then we, 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 we look at the, the most important parts of, of all the features, and then we release it. And incrementally, we notice um, that, okay, this is the next phase that we want to you know, um, release in, in, into the market, and then we build it. While we do that, we also prioritize um, users' um, feedback and um, requests and um, customers complain. So whenever we, we go into our, our development cycles, uh, we, we also think about what our users are, are the feedback they are giving to us, what, what they think about the product, the new things that we, we, we believe is going to make, um, you know, using the product uh, more um, user-friendly, more flexible, we, we, we start to work on, on those one as well. So, um, Part of the things that we, we've, we've done in the past couple of months, before we actually released the product in the market, it, we went into um, more like, uh, I think, four cycles of um, sprints. So in our agile methodology, we use, um, we go into by, by weekly sprints such that um, after we define the things that we want to roll out, we build it within two weeks. 
So once that is done, we review the past two weeks, uh, what, what everything we, we highlighted at the beginning of the sprint. And once we were done, we, we move on to the next one. So we went into like four cycles of that before we actually released the first product into, into beta. And we were in beta for about um, four weeks, or no, eight weeks actually, uh, before we actually launched publicly. And since then, um, for those that joined the beta uh, version of the application, you will have seen that a lot of things have um, changed. Have, um, you know, we've iterated on, on some of the things that we started with initially. And this is what um, you know, developing the products with um, Agile methodology gives us. So we don't um, break the products in any way, and we keep on adding new things to it. And that's basically how we work here uh, at the um, engineering department. Um, so basically, um, what we do is um, me being, being the head of the engineering, um, we have a product manager that helps us, you know, break down all these things. In this, I mentioned earlier that we work in um, bi-weekly sprints. So be, at, the, at the beginning of the sprint, just um, before it gets started, we break up this, um, the things we want to get done within, a, within, that sprint, within the two weeks, we break it down, um, mostly done by uh, me and the uh, product manager. So we break it down, we look at what is visible within that, those two weeks. And once that is done, uh, we now introduce these new features, new, these new things that we want to work on uh, for, the, for the two weeks. We introduce it to the team and we just deliberate on it. We, we, we go back and forth on uh, you know, thinking and discussing about what's best uh, approach to, to, to um, introduce the things. And once we, we, all, we all done, we just assign tasks to um, the developers based on um, availab the availability, you know, how soon are they able to get their first tax done, they'd pick on the next one. And at the end of the sprint, we review um, everything done, and then we see, uh, it, it goes through a QA, and what the QA does is that it just goes through the things that we highlighted at the beginning of the sprint, ensures that everything works the way, the way they work. There are times that things don't go through and it just has to like, uh, we, we just put it back to the next sprint until it is done, tested and, and perfect before we, we release it back uh, into, the, in, into the market. Um, one, one other thing that we, we, we learned from our users and um, that has been more like a challenge for us, um, you know, product uh, development is that there are a lot of devices out there and it's, it's kind of like um, challenging to actually get a sense of how the, the, the products looks on every single device. So which is where the um, feedback that we, we get from our customers come in play. We have a Telegram group where we get this first hand feedback from our users and they sort of like um, let us know mostly how the, the, how the application, how the products looks on their device their issues and, and um, the challenges they have. And once we get that, we just go back to the drawing board, look at what is happening for that particular device, and then we, we, we try to tackle it from there. So basically that is just um, product development at Rise for you. Um, um, if you have any Q questions, you can always um, drop it in the Q&A uh, box, I guess, so that it can be, um, or answer, yeah. Amazing. Um, so we already have a bunch of questions in our Q and A. Um, okay. Otas, are you there? All right. So we're going to take a couple of these questions. What are the additional services coming out from Rise in the nearest future? Speaking from the expansionist standpoint. Um, so I think, um, and it's something we've discussed about what else can we build and how do we go ahead and, and extend our products into other areas. And we typically would like to, to we, we like to go with what um, users, right? What there seems to be a demand for from our users. 
or other additional services that we think would help our users achieve um, the next level of, of being, you know, doing finance, doing their finances well, doing investments well. Um, just generally, we know that if you're doing your investments in a certain way, then what are the additional services that will help improve the results for you? Or what are some things that, you know, based on the data, based on interaction with our users, what are some things that users are asking for? And so we have a, a version two of our product currently in development um, that we know it's going to be um, one where we're building it from ground up. Um, we think it's going to be just um, so much better. Um, we also know that it's going to work. Um, it's going to allow more users to do a lot more than um, a lot more of what they want to do. And so we're really looking forward to that. And, and I'm sure that as we go along, and there's, there's going to be additional services. Um, we have some in the pipeline that we are, you know, we're working and testing out um, with our, um, within our team. And eventually we'll start testing it out with our users. So um, I think one thing that, that we talked about is um, that RISE, we're almost, we're almost always going to be in some kind of beta mode, right? Because we're always going to have some things being worked on. And, and using the process that um, that Boston just talked about, those changes are going to roll out incrementally um, once we do this um, version two. So, um, let me see. We'll take like a few other questions for five minutes, and then I think we have a second poll that is coming up. Paul um, said, "How secured is Rise?" B, do you want to do you want to answer that question? Um, okay. Yeah. So um, we, we take security at RISE very serious uh, because you know we are dealing with um, users' um, money, and we just don't want um, anything to happen to it. So what what we do is um, the 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 communication between the app and the and the backend where the data is stored and the logic all the logic um, happens. Um, we have, we use this, um, they call it JW, uh, JSON Web Token, JWT Token to, you know, en um, encode the data that we transfer from um, the, the back end to the front end to authenticate the user. So, and what we, what we do is that um, we only keep this, um, this um, token live for, for um, a short, short period. And when it expires, we ensure that we ensure that um, we we renew it as long as you're still using the app. And if you are not using the app, it just um, you know disables the, the disables the app. Also, we implemented um, in terms of like user user experience, also you know um, protect your applic the application from unauthorized access. We introduced um, the pin um, lock on the application that lets you, that locks the app once, once you leave it for um, say about a few minutes, you go back to it, it's locked and it asks, asks for your pin to unlock it. So that protects the, the application on your side. And from our own side, we, we ensure that uh, the, the sensitive data are uh, encrypted on the backend and um, we just don't let um, data fly around any, 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 anyhow. And that's, it, it's important, I, I like that question anyway, it's important because um, people need to know how, how safe and secure their investments are, um, their, their, their money, then, so that they, they just don't um, get, get their, their, sorry, their accounts and their investment doesn't get into unauthorized um, hands. So we, we, we monitor that and then we, we take some time to look at um, users, um, history, if we notice some um, inconsistencies in, in application, for example, there are times that users will just reach out to us that they misplace their phone. What we just do immediately is that we protect their account and disable it so that unauthorized person cannot just access their app. So um, those are the things that we, we, we ensure that we, we do at um, right here so that we, we, we want to make sure that you, you should feel confident that your, your um, account is um, safe. Right. Um, so just uh, while you guys keep sending more questions, um, Tony, Tony will go ahead and introduce himself, talk a little bit about his background, what he does at RISE. And then um, there's a question about our new management fee regime that um, I'm sure Tony can also um, tackle. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Firstly, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to come hang with us. Um, one thing I really love about RISE is its community, right? Um, it's something we're immensely proud of, and we definitely do not take it for granted. So um, thank you. Um, so a bit about me. I know for uh, most of you here, it's the first time seeing or hearing about me. And the most you know about me is the awkward photo that my team decided to use. <laughs> right? Um, we've, we've made a few jokes about it internally. Um, anyways, I'm Anthony Udiba. I'm the CEO at RISE. I'm glad to formally introduce myself to you all. Um, a few of you that have had um, one reason or the other to call customer care over the past few months um, actually spoke to me. So um, I hope I treated your complaints um, very professionally. Um, I studied electrical electronics engineering at Covenant University, you know, worked in the power sector, telecom sector, and worked as a senior research engineer at NASA, that's our National Space Research and Development Agency. Um, I also co-founded a tech and innovation hub called IC7. Um, it's currently operational or still operational in Abuja. You can check that out. Um, and then I joined the amazing team at Rise um, on the journey to provide Africans, you know, starting with Nigerians, with the opportunity to grow their wealth through um, access to global dollar denominated investments. Um, I'll talk briefly about um, three things. I'll talk about our operations, you know, um, analytics. Then I'll talk about how we select our stocks for our Rise um, index or portfolio. So. Um, the key to any successful business, right, is to make sure that you're smoothly um, or you're operating your business smoothly, right, so that you can grow your business efficiently and satisfy your users as you guys. Um, to do that, you have to make sure that all the spokes in a proverbial um, wheel that, you know, makes rise turn is sturdy and, it, and everything is working in unison to play their part. Um, all the systems and processes that, that help us run smoothly have to be closely watched and managed. So to make sure that, um, to make sure that our customer service is top notch, you know, um, productivity um, across our team is top notch. You know, our engineers are turning out beautiful code that works. You know, every member of their, of their respective team is outputting quality work. You know, we have to try to make all these disparate parts work well. And that is essentially why I do it at um, RISE, right? And then if any member of the team isn't um, um, performing at optimal level, you know, try to find out why that is. And, and, and I have to say that we're very, very lucky at the quality of um, um, our team members that we have at RISE. And I'm sure AK would tell us a bit more about the team when he, when, when he comes on. So um, to achieve all I've said, um, we have to make sure that the overarching strategy that has been set for the team on a quarterly basis is distilled in a manner that, that is well understood and internalized by every member of our team, right? And that's where we employ tools like OKR to help. And what, what OKR, OKR is objectives and key results. And by the way, um, so that largely serves as a map to guide us to where we need to go and to keep everyone on the team focused and centered and aligned. So um, let me just reiterate, OKRs are like the, the roadmap that, that shows us um, how to get to our destination. And our destination is our company's mission and vision, right? So. Um, um, the objectives are like the desired results um, for our company and the key results are like measurable ways that lets us know we're on track to reaching them, right? So, um, and to do that, you know, we have to measure stuff, right? And that's where analytics now, now comes in. Um, so, um, to put it on that way, right, we have to know what our company's mission and vision is, you know, that will now inform our overall um, company strategy, we'll now choose to adopt um, that company strategy, you know, convert that to strategic OKRs, and then um, disseminate that to all our team members and 
and get everybody centered. So um, I know that sounds a bit abstract. So um, let me let me um, let me jump into uh, let me use an analogy. So just imagine rice um, as a car. So so obviously rice. If if rice were were a car, it would obviously be like a Tesla truck because you know what we do, <laughs> right. So, so we, the team, are, are in the car, you know, AK driving, Boston shotgun, Otaz, Ona's corner, you know, Muna and Ife, you know, at the back and all that. Um, some of us, obviously, since there's no space, we'll be in the back of the truck. But, <laughs> so, so we're all driving towards our company's goals and objectives, right? And the roadmap that gets us there are our OKRs, right? And they are tied to monthly and quarterly strategic objectives. And the, the, the mile markers, right, um, would be our key results. And that lets us know whether we're headed in the right direction or not. So, so extending the car analogy, we, we need to keep an eye on our dashboard, you know, to make sure that our car batteries don't run out, um, to make sure that there are no potholes on the way. And, and that is, that's, that's primarily what our analytics is for. You know, it helps us measure stuff to know that um, we are headed in the in the right direction. So um, that's just a brief um, summary about what I help um, our team to do at Rise. Um, yeah. To to jump in there a little bit. So I know some of our users when we were running our referral program, um, there were a lot of questions about, oh, you know. Well, you guys are giving uh, money for uh, referrals, and you know, is that going to put you guys under threat? And you know, we're confident in in the fact that okay, well, we've discussed it, and we know Tony is watching our numbers. We know that oh, yeah. we had a budget for this, um, and we also are tracking the level of awareness, which is really what the referral campaign was for. It's, it's to boost that early awareness of our of our exactly. product, right? Um, so yeah. most of the initiatives that we do to make sure that we're tracking them correctly, we're getting the results for them, you know, we're staying within a certain budget and, and just make, making sure that the cost and the results kind of balance and also managing internally. Um, what exactly. Does. So someone asked a question about uh, management. You know, let me take a few questions actually so that um, we're able to address some of the things that you all are curious about in real time. So someone says, I understand equity investment is the most volatile with possibly the highest return. However, does RISE have a stop loss strategy in place where the market goes extremely bearish? So that's a great question about our portfolio. Um, so there's two other people who, who also work on the portfolio side with me. One of them is actually external to the team. He has about 15 years experience doing this and, uh, and we lean heavily on his experience for some of the things that we do. And then there's um, two others, Dami and, um, and uh, Chinevu, who are financial analysts as well. Um, so we have back and forths about, about choosing investments and really how we manage our portfolio. But to answer your question broadly, um, yes, we, we do um, operate a stop loss. Um, in some cases, especially as, as, since we're holding positions for a very long time, um, we, we, we add a stop to prevent that, you know, if there's a, a severe market decline from really affecting um, the, the portfolio. Um, secondly, we also have like, well, essentially a bit of a hedge. So we, we have a, a broad market short position, um, just never more than 5% of the portfolio to kind of counterbalance um, the, the, the downward movement when, 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 when the market is in decline. But um, to going back to how we think about our assets, right? These are long-term, uh, long-term assets. So we're not, re and we don't project. We don't say, oh, um, you're going to make ten percent when you're with rise, right? So you said, um, how do we balance um, the the so with possibly the highest return, and how do we pre uh, have that uh, stop-loss strategy so that the, when we prevent the market bearishness, right? So. The point that we're trying to make with that is, and someone asked a similar question about returns. We're not saying, oh, if you come in here, come in, you'll make 10% on the, the only asset class that has a guaranteed um, return is uh, the euro bond because it's a fixed income asset and therefore it has a fixed return um, as well. So uh, I, I think it goes to understand how RISE's proposition is different. 
We're giving you access to different type of investments and each of those investments have their own, you know, the, the, the philosophy, their risk profile and the long-term returns profile, right? So what we're saying with stocks is you're going to be investing in the highest quality stocks on the market that have the best long-term growth potential. And, you know, while we manage the movements of the portfolio in the short term, really um, most of the outcome is from continuing to make a consistent investment in this asset over a long period, right? So um, when the portfolio falls, for instance, most of the time it just allows us to buy more because we're buying consistently over time. And um, if we buy when it drops, um, that actually lowers our overall cost of, of um, purchase so that when the market eventually then bounces back, um, you, the returns or the gains are that much higher. And I think most people who have been um, who have gone through these wild swings over the last four months with our, with our products will tell you that um, a lot of the declines that happened around March um, has really recovered and then pushed them way higher into like returns territory. And so that's because when the market dips as it does, we, we go ahead and buy. Um, so Thank you, AK. Oh, still speaking. Um. <laughs> Ahead, so, um, Tony, would you like to explain the new management fee? That's one of the questions on there. Oh, okay. Um, so I'll, I'll try to do that without um, sounding too technical. Um, so we introduced the management fee, right? And, and we got a bit of pushback from our users, and, and that was actually understandable, right? Um, um, but at the same time, Rise needs to make money so that we can continue delivering this excellent service to, to you guys. But um, I know I and my team would be the first to, to admit that um, we, we probably didn't do that or rule that out um, the best um, way, right? So um, currently what we have right now is um, it's tiered, right? So you have a 1.5% um, fee if you make money above a certain threshold, right? So um, you'd be charged 1.5% after we make you money. So, so it goes back to the original um, 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 plan, right? And that, that was, we only charge you once we make money for you. So if you make above 10% um, after we've taken our, our uh, management fee, as after we take the management fee, if you're still up 10%, we now take the, the we now get to keep the money, right? That's um, what the 1.5%. So the 1.5% is for users that make um, within the 10% to 15% band. Above that, we now charge you 2%. And that's across um, all the three asset classes that we currently have on our platform. Uh, I hope that answers your question. And that's going to be taken after, not before. And we apologize for um, doing that before. So. Okay, there's another question, um, AK. I would like to know when dollar denominated cards would be allowed to make transfer without excess charges. Yeah, so um, we're working with, so we, on Rise, uh, most of our payments are processed by third parties, right? So um, we're working with them to make sure that um, the, we are able to set the rates essentially. So before what was happening is when you want to um, pay with your dollar card, um, the service provider either charges in Naira and it basically applies their own rate or um, sets the rate and then adds on, adds on a fee. So what we're working on them now to be working with them to do, and I think that rules up also, we're supposed to make some changes in order mm -hmm. to allow users to select what currency they want to be charged in and mm -hmm. then we set a rate so that if you say you want to pay $500, um, for instance, and you want to be charged in dollars, we already know what the fee from the payment processor side is, and that's the only other charge you get. Um, so that way it's much more straightforward. So there'll be like the $500 plus a maybe 1.9% fee, something like that. And then if you want to be charged in Naira, um, then you will see the rates in Naira, and then you go ahead and, and manage those conversions. So um, once we make those changes, um, then anybody would be able to pay with whatever card that they have. 
um, and select their own currency and they charge exactly the fee that they see before they pay. So um, expect to see that change in the next two weeks. Thank you. Um, next question, how does RISE make money? And can I trust RISE West to be around for my five-year financial plan? Uh, I think that, well, first, Tony, Tony explained um, part of the, the, the reason that we added our fees. And, and like he pointed out, um, that process could have been managed a lot better. Um, but we realized that for us to be able to stick around, build a really amazing, and really um, part of the reason we decided we're going to add that fee right now is because we're thinking about the version two and how solid of a product that's going to be. And we realized that we need more resources to make that happen. Um, but as far as our longevity, um, so we think about it in multiple ways. One is thanks to leveraging technology and building through a very um, lean, agile process, we don't need to have a very large team in it to, to be able to do the work that we want to do for you. And so once we charge enough to you know, pay our team well, invest in resources to deliver better products, um, you shouldn't really worry about Rise's solvency, right? So that's the first thing. So we're on that score, we're going to be here for a really long time. So five years seems like a short time based on the way we do our planning, we plan out for. We, we already have a plan for what our revenue numbers, our products and user numbers, um, and our, the asset class that we should have by year five. But our plans extend into like almost the next 10, 15, 20 years um, down the line. So RISE is really trying to be an institution that is gonna stick around for a long time. Um, and so we'll be here to support whatever plans that you're making financially, not just within Nigeria, but eventually beyond Nigeria. So I think that that answers your question. You really shouldn't worry about us being around. Um, we're here. And if as a team, just to point that out, that um, if one individual is not there, that does not stop everybody else from still delivering on our mission. I think that's something we've really worked hard to make sure that um, everybody on the team is working hand in hand towards this mission. Thank you, AK. Um, the next two questions I'm going to ask is one for Boston to answer. Um, one person says automatic deduction has never worked and this is not acceptable. What is the way forward? And the second one is withdrawals from RISE have been an issue. What are you guys doing to improve on this? I have not made any withdrawals myself, but the experience from those who have is not good enough. Um, all right. So, um, so uh, okay. So withdrawals are, are on the application. So the way we handle withdrawals is that, you know, it, it takes time before we um, liquidate the investments and then before we convert it down to the currency that we want to pay out to the user. So that is why we, we, we said that it's going to take between three to five working days. Sometimes um, I, 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 I agree that the messaging should be clearer and users should understand what's going on. And they should be able to see that, okay, this, this is what is holding up their withdrawals, if I thought it was anything. There are times that, uh, because we process these um, withdrawals through a third party, there are times that we, we eat some, you know, challenges with the third party that we need to, like, we, that take some time before we, we resolve with them. So those things um, sometimes delay the, the, the withdrawals. But, but I'm, I'm going to say that there are times that we do it within, within a day, within two days, but um, the maximum that we've actually gone is um, maybe five working days. And, you know, there are times that we, people make withdrawals on a Friday and then, um, you know, they just count the weekend with the whole, you know, the number of days it takes to process their withdrawals. Yeah, so that's one of the things. And we are actually working really, really hard to, to make this thing um, seamless so that we can start, we can process withdrawals faster. So that is, that is, it's important. Before we go into the, um, your investment, we get it down and then convert it, it, it takes time. Yeah. That one, I'm not sure. I'm not sure there is a way to speed that one up, but then there's still um, areas that we know that, yeah, we can actually do better. And yeah, we are working to, on uh, that. And, and to add to what Boston just said, um, so if we are actually saying that we're investing in those underlining businesses, you know, that, that um, those underlining businesses um, when we regards to those respective asset classes, um, then you should understand that if you need to divest from that position, in essence, we'd have to 
you know, take out your own portion from that asset class, mm -hmm. um, repatriate it down to Nigeria and now pay you out. So it should even be a cause of concern if we are able to pay you out immediately. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, yeah, yeah, so they should, you might think, you might even like think, okay, there might be something fishy with this company. What are they using our money to do that they are able to pay us out immediately? One of two things, right? Either we have dead capital um, lying somewhere and we're able to just pay you out instantaneously and that isn't actually good for our operations, right? So that is essentially why we cannot pay as fast as we want now, right? But, but it's something that we have um, thought about deeply and mm -hmm. we're also working really hard to, to you know, facilitate that, that process speedily. So um, thank you for that question. So yeah. To wrap, to wrap that no. up, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. The, the, because I still want about, to answer the other one. Yeah, I, I, I know you will. If you think about where what stage we're at, um, we'll get to the point where we have a float that is in dollars. So there's two main challenges here. We can't keep funds in Naira because again, that's going to work against us and against users. And secondly, we have tangible assets that we have to liquidate. Um, but again, as we scale our operations up, we're going to have a float that is in dollars that we can quickly move to Naira when we need. So uh, again, these things will become faster over time. I just wanted to add that there. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And to answer the automatic deduction thing, um, I'm pretty sure that it works. Um, the issue here might be uh, peculiar to the, um, the user's account. So I think the... the the, um, the expected thing to do here is um, we need to look at the, account, the, the user's accounts uh, to confirm like what is going on, what is making it not work. So we've seen situations where users will set up automatic deduction and when it's time to make that deduction, they don't have money in their account. So once we try that, we try to you know, put money from that account a couple of times and it failed, we just disable, we automatically disable that de deduction and we send an email to the user letting them know that the deduction that we're supposed to make at this point, um, we couldn't make it. Um, could you just go ahead and um, take a look at the accounts, fund it, and then you can re-enable re the, the um, automatic deduction back? Because it doesn't make sense for us to keep charging, trying to charge the accounts when we know that the last time we did, there was no, there was no funds in it. So um, I would say you should re reach out to our support with your um, account, um, e the email you have on, on, on the right, on Rise Up, then we can, we can take a look at the, at the account for you and be able to specifically tell you that this is what actually happened to your automatic deduction. Thank mm. you, Bosom, all of you, really. Someone, someone made a good observation about um, adding, adding some kind of uh, form for people that want to, and to, like you want to make, basically make a request for withdrawal ahead of time. Um, that's something that I think we could, we could include in our product. So nice feedback there from Chinyere. Thank you. Um, how can I invest in Eurobond on behalf of my children? AK, do you wanna answer that? Um, so I think uh, we've got some requests like this and, and shout out to your kids for having someone <laughs> talk about them and their future, so, 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 so wonderful to witness. Um, so I think that um, a lot of people have asked us these questions um, and currently on the current product, you can create a plan and name them after any of your kids and set up an automatic billing. Um, but again, we know that that's not perfect. So um, for version two, that's one of the things that we've improved on version two, where now we can actually create a plan um, specifically, you know, whether it's a save up for your kids or you know, save up for the education, set a timeline, set a beneficiary, right? And make, that, make your kid that beneficiary. And so that way you know that this is an independent plan specifically for my kid. Um, we're also experimenting with like being able to have sub accounts or joint accounts, but um, we, we, we definitely think that by version two, you'd be able to do a lot more of this. So um, just look forward to that. And again, it's, it's coming up in the next two months. Um, Tony, do, would you like to explain, uh, someone has a question, what is ARM, ARM Lab all about and how will it benefit RISE investors? You're muted, right? Yeah, Tony, you're mute. Sorry, thanks. So in collaboration with um, um, Ventures Platform, they started 
um, something called ARM Labs, right? And that's essentially where they, um, they scour or look for um, fintechs that are doing interesting stuff that they, they, they would like to be a part of. And they basically make equity investments in those companies if they see, you know, um, future prospects in those companies. So um, we were fortunate enough to, um, you know, get accepted to the ARM program, and we were one. We were part of the last three that that um, that made it to the final stage, right? Because you know uh, we're, we're doing not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so um, so and and that was strategic on our part as well because we had other um, you know institutional investors cutting us, but. And um, it was important to go that route because, you know, ARM has, they have structure, you know, they differ from startups in, so, so, so a startup has its own advantages, right? You are nimble, you can, you can move quickly, right? But there are also advantages to being a, a long, um, a long lasting institution like ARM, you have structure, you can navigate, you know, the regulatory waters and stuff. So, so those were part of the very key reasons that we chose to go with ARM. So that partnership can help us um, um, draw out like um, some sort of trusteeship um, um, relationship with our, that, that, that our users can now benefit from. So it was a strategic decision and it, trust me, it's going to, it's going to help in the long run. So, um, Cheers to you guys for that, because yeah, the one's going to um, reap the benefits of that, that partnership. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. AK, um, can RiseVest benchmark the returns against some index, say S&P, NYSE index? So, yeah, um, we could, but there's, there's, there's some friction to that. And again, it, we've thought about this before. So the two the, the friction the two frictions are this one is if you want to say we benchmark our equity index to say S and P five hundred right um, we know inherently that when we think about asset selection um, we're not just thinking about oh let's let's benchmark let's select the assets that we think are going to beat S and P five hundred we're thinking about assets that we think about our stocks portfolio like almost like businesses right so. We want to think about what are the businesses you want to own for a really long time. And therefore, um, if we benchmark against the S&P 500, um, in some years we'll do better, in some years we'll do uh, worse. And I don't know that that will be, because once you benchmark to something, you kind of have to work towards that as a goal. So I think it fundamentally shifts the goal for us, right? It makes us where our goal becomes, oh, we have to beat our index, right? But that's not right. the goal. Really. Uh, our goal is that, um, you're not making the highest, poss like highest possible returns in a single year, but what you're doing is that you're making positive returns that are stable for the long term. And the easiest way to express that is think about um, two fund managers. And let's say in one year you have 20% positive, the next year you're negative 15%. And the next day you're at positive 40%, and the next day you're negative 25%. Think about that trajectory over 10 years, right? Or 20 years. Now consider another fund manager who just makes somewhere between three to five or seven percent every year positive, but it's always in positive territory for the span of that 10, 20 years. When you compute their total um, long-term performance, you find out that the second person, even though in each year he was never at the top. Um, but in the long run, he will always be at the top 10%, top 5% even of any fund manager's performance, right? So um, that's some of the things that we consider. Um, the second part of it is that we are lo looking at across your portfolio. So when we look at RISE, we think about the fact that we want you to hold equities, we want you to hold um, real estate, we want you to hold fixed income. And, you know, eventually we'll add up maybe private equity, we're going to add maybe crypto. There are certain asset classes that we think anybody should be exposed to across the board. Um, so when you have those acro uh, across the board portfolio segmentation, there's no one single index that is a perfect comparison, right? So the real comparison is, are you making good returns? Are those returns stable and consistent over a long period of time? And what does that help you achieve? That's, that's our benchmark. Thank you. 
Um, someone has a question. I think we answered part of it earlier, but uh, I'll ask for the second part. How does RISE Vest protect user data? Is RISE NDPR compliant? Um, so let me take that question. Um, so one, one of the things that we do uh, as a, and NDPR is the Nigeria's data regulations that was, that was passed, I believe last year. Um, but we, we think about our responsibility beyond, so RISE is going to be a global product. And so we're not only thinking about local data protection regulations, but also on a global scale. How do we manage user data? Um, and how do we make sure that users, users information is kept securely? And so um, the short answer to that is yes, we are, we are NDPR compliant and we are working to be, so there's, there's a number of other jurisdictions that have even more stringent regulations um, but part of our operations interspaces into the US and the amount of regulatory compliance that we have to keep up with just to make sure that we can keep those operations going across the board um, is very, very deep. And so um, we continue to work for, for instance, one of the things that we're thinking about for version two, and that was something that regulatory um, regulators, especially on the US side, really pointed out is that we want your app um, to, to be tied to a certain device. And if you try to log into it from another device, then um, it's, it's going to require to do certain like uh, two-factor authentication or just to verify your identity and whatever. So those are some things that are coming on board. Um, but yeah, we really try to benchmark against global standards. And, and, and that's, that's, that should give us um, a lot of confidence from a user standpoint. Awesome. So I'm going to ask these next two questions about the same person. Um, and I think either AK or Tony, which should be able to handle them. Uh, who are your brokerage firms? Are they protected by SIPC? If yes, to what amount and how will the amount claimed to be redistributed to RISE users in case this risk crystallizes? Um, second half of that is who are your regulators and how do they regulate your activities? All right. Um... So we have, we use Alpaca as, a, as an API provider. So basically Alpaca is a brokerage firm, but rather than being a traditional brokerage, um, they basically allow you to use API endpoints to essentially build your, your um, assets, to select assets and build um, a portfolio programmatically, right? So um, they do have all the relevant SIPC coverage. I think it's up to 500,000. And usually what happens is if there's a, a a systemic failure or anything that triggers SIPC's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, SIPC's insurance um, coverage, um, then would get that reimbursed to our portfolio, which then cascades down to our users. Um, and then, uh, what was the second question again? Who are your regulators? How exactly do they regulate your activities? Awesome. So for the Nigerian side, um, we have a cooperative license that essentially allows us to manage investments for our users. Um, and we are, um, we are required to report, um, I think someone also asked the question about how do we manage um, to make sure, that, how do we know that the numbers that we're working with are actually what, they, what we're doing, what we say, on, what you see on the app is actually what we're doing behind the scenes. And so we are required to report our accounts, um, <clears throat> our accounts as a whole to legal state government every six months. Um, we're also discussing, I think we initiated a conversation last week with Nigerian um, SEC to essentially work with them to build, because some of what we're doing is new um, and they extend across geographies. And so we're going to join their sandbox to make sure that we can, we can design a regulatory um, structure that allows users to have confidence additionally in other things that we're going to introduce in the future. So, but on the Nigerian side, that's, that's what, what it looks like. On the U.S. side, we have a registered investment advisory firm um, that essentially holds those assets, has relationships with our brokers, has relationships with, um, as we work with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, um, and basically acts as the custodian for the assets on the US side. And again, it's regulated by the state and the federal government on the US side. And so some of those information we'll also be able to share um, if someone reached out to us privately. And, and because again, there are some things that we can't give you over a call like this, but yes, we do manage to, we do, uh, we are regulated on both sides of the ocean. Awesome. Um, there are a few questions about 
once again, the management fees, I'm just going to ask them all as one, but basically are the fees only on the returns or on both the capital and the returns? All right. So, <clears throat> sorry. Um, they are both on the capital and the returns, but <clears throat> if you, if you consider the fact that we are charging you after you make that 10%, right? You know that your, your capital doesn't, doesn't really get affected. Um, <clears throat> we can do the math, but um, I, I guess we have a Q and A um, available online, and we actually break it down. We actually break the math down so that you can check and see that your principal isn't being affected after we've made you above a certain threshold. So I hope that answers your question. Your principal and the ten percent <clears throat> of your Ex exact exactly. So um, I guess that that should answer your question. Um, someone has a same question, just like an expansion. For those with up to two asset classes, does the 1.5% apply to each or yeah, yeah. the asset classes? Okay. It's, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, sorry. Let me take this question because I think it allows us to gain clarity on how we select our, 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 okay. <laughs> our assets. Someone asks, who is in charge of the trade decisions you make? Is the mm -hmm. person that you're paying? Um, so, Tony, start from start from the algorithm and basically right. cool, answer that cool. question because you missed it dope. before. Yeah, dope. so so um, there's a rigorous process that we go through um, while we're trying to select the the stocks that we want to add to our um, portfolio. And what what happens is okay, so it's going to be. I hope it doesn't get boring and um, it's a bit technical as well. So just bear with me. So there's, there's something called a 13F that the SEC in the US um, mandates fund managers that manage in excess of $100 million to file on a quarterly basis. And that contains all the positions that they have you know, in that quarter. And it also contains like new, new, um, stocks, new stocks in um, companies that they've added, right? So what we did is we wrote a program, right? And shout out to um, Samusin, I'm sure he's someone on this call, it helps with that. Uh, so we have, we, as I said, we have awesome um, people in our team. Right? So, 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 um, so we wrote a program to basically parse those um, filings, right? So what, what happens is we check for new positions that have been added across all the fund managers, right? We now aggregate that. And the, 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 the positions that, are, um, that appear more frequently, right? We now put that in a pool of companies that we want to do some further research into, right? So we now check the 10 keys. 10 keys are um, other filings that contain, you know, the balance sheets and, um, and other interesting stuff that our analysts will now use to assess the viability and growth potential of those companies. And then we now, um, after doing the research, they have like an internal debate into um, whether it meets the criteria that we want to use, that, uh, sorry, criteria that have been laid down you know, for companies that, that are uh, attractive enough for us to invest in. And then if he does um, scale through those criteria, you know, um, AK, Nevo, um, Dami, you know, they have, you know, um, intense debates. And they now, uh, we now decide whether that company should go into um, our portfolio. Right. So to, to distill everything, and I think, I hope that that really provides insight into what the, the process um, is for asset selection. So, but to, to just summarize that clearly, we look at this as we're, we're taking the best ideas of the best fund managers, right? Across the board. Um, what are all the stocks that are driving interest across the best fund managers across the US? And then we take all of them, we rank them according to our own criteria and say, okay, out of all these positions that we've isolated that everybody that knows what, you know, these fund managers have research budgets, they've been doing this for years, they have really interesting ideas, and all of them, if all of them are moving into one position, or if there's a lot of interest in a certain stock, that tells you that there's something very qualitatively good about this stock, right? So when we then take all of them, we then say, all right, when we look at all these lists, which one has the best, you know, earnings power, management, long-term growth potential, uh, market or competitive advantage, and we then have an internal, it, it's, debate is the right word, but it's like a ranking. So I'll rank my top five, you know, someone else will say, all right, um, these are my own top five. And then we compare notes and say, all right, based on everything that we've looked at, these are the strongest ideas 
among all of these and those make it into our portfolio. So it's not really one person's decision. Um, and it's also, it makes it, that's also one of the reasons why we have a lot of confidence that even if in the short term, the market is all, you know, sideways and up and down, really in the long term, these are companies that are going to really become very valuable over time. Awesome. I hope that answers the question more clearly. Um, Bosum, does the app have biometric access as an alternative to PIN? Uh, yes, the, the app has biometric access. Um, so we introduced biometric login about two releases ago. And yeah, so if your device is um, biometric enabled, yeah, you, you have this button just beside the login that you can tap and then um, authenticate yourself in. And yes, it doesn't lock the app for you the way the pin does. But, but then it's um, when, you are, when you log out, you don't have to like um, enter your email and password before you, you know, log in back. You can just, you know, um, tap the um, biometric button and then it's either you, if, if you have face ID, uh, yeah, it, it logs you in by just, you know, looking at your face. Or uh, if you have, uh, if it's touch, touch ID, just touch the, the sensor and you, you are in, in the app. So um, in the next build, what we have is that you can now toggle this functionality on and off. So if you decide that you don't want to, you know, have um, biometric login on your app, um, even though your device can allow you to do that, you can just um, switch it off and you won't have to see that, that button on the login screen again. But yeah, we, have, we do have biometric login on the application. Okay. Um... The RiseVest app only picks auto invest from registered cards. Can it be automated such that it can also take funds from the wallet? Bosum, can you take that? Hmm, that's actually a nice idea. So currently we don't, we don't have that and it's something that we can definitely look into. As long as you, you ensure that there's always going to be money available in your wallet, we can, we can set that up so that the auto invest picks money fixed funds from the wallet. Awesome. Um, sorry, there are quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> Can we invest in foreign ETFs through RiseVest? Some of us would want an exposure to a broader set of companies without buying stocks in the different companies. Thank you. Okay. I think you would. Yeah. So the, the, the way we think about it, and um, I think I, I've, I've, I've hinted at the fact that um, it's, it's not possible for us to accommodate almost every style of investing um, because we make the final decisions about what uh, goes into our portfolio. However, um, from an indexing standpoint, a decent chunk of um, users' assets of our portfolio is held in S&P 500, right? Because again, you need some kind of market exposure. We think about it as a base for whatever additional investments that we want to make. Um, so that's the broad market exposure that we have. Um, also, we have um, a smaller short position to hedge against market movements to kind of counterbalance that. So within Rise's portfolio, you already have some kind of market exposure embedded within it. Um, but if you want to directly um, buy an ETF of your own or just go in and say, well, I want to select so-and-so ETF, you wouldn't be able to do that in RISE right now. But if you want to have a sense of broad market exposure um, so that your, your part of your returns are exposed to the overall market, then yes, we already do that. That's, that's basically um, portfolio theory at this level. Um, and, and yes, you get that exposure even with using RISE. So it's not just only the specific stocks, it's also a portion, it's almost 20% um, that is exposed to the broad market. Um, also, AK, for real estate returns, other than rental income, do you get a professional valuer to do valuations monthly, or how exactly is the capital gain determined? Right, so we, we do the capital gains annually. We, we, we couldn't possibly get properties um, revalued every month. Um, they, their value doesn't move that quickly. Um, but yeah, we do get, so we, we depend on either, um, we, we have a disposal, so we know that, well, oh, this is the exact capital gains that we've actually acquired, or 
um, we get evaluation done at the end of the year, just once a year, and then update the value of the portfolio and account for the capital gains. Um, so that's how we think about it, but definitely not monthly. Good thinking. Um, this one, I think kind of already answered. It says, do you guys have plans for the inevitable? Like say, God forbid, what happens in the case of death of one of the founders? Um, I will say at right now, Rise is bigger than any one person. And so if the worst has happened, we will be very sad, but we will keep going. Pretty much. <laughs> um, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, how do you guys determine the daily return on Eurobond? Um, do, do you want to take that? Oh, oh yeah. So um, because Eurobond is, as at last week, a, um, you know, defined... Um, guaranteed returns. So what we just did is that, okay, depending on the duration that you pick, you just split down this um, um, expected return into you know, chunks of small daily returns for you. That's basically how, how, how it's done. Right, and, and to add, that's why um, we can do, you know, stock, stock moves daily, and therefore um, we can always basically latch onto the performance and we know exactly what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Eurobonds mm -hmm. has a fixed return and we can break that up into daily, daily returns um, chunks. Um, real estate, on the other hand, is impossible. So we essentially rely on the monthly income generated. And that's why I say a lot of people who are on the real estate plan are like, oh, why can't we see our returns daily? That's basically because, um, and we don't, uh, it's never really the exact same amount every month because either maybe we're adding, um, we're adding portfolio, we're adding to the real estate portfolio and our, so our rental income, we, we can't just, we can't do it into daily returns the way we can the other two asset classes. That's basically the summary of that, but yeah. Okay, um, does RISE have any trustees or custodians, did we answer this? Doing an oversight over the mode and performance of the assets under their management. I think we answered that with our regulatory. Yeah. Um, but then we, as we grow, we will continue to beef that up over time. Um, for a newbie investor, what is the best assets to investing? One that will be fit for this level of risk appetite. We try not to, we try not to make recommendations. <laughs> we, so so here, here's, what, here's the two ways we can think about it. Well, first is for a newbie investor, it, it comes down to it's not really about maybe your level of understanding because, but yeah, it's about where your financial situation is um, and then what makes the most sense, right? So if you're younger, um, even if your risk appetite is, um, is too low that, you know, maybe you don't want to get into stocks, um, but maybe that because you're young and you make a pretty decent income and you have a long time to go, stocks might actually be the most ideal for you, right? So, but, this is another change that we're making from version one and version two, where when you come in, we get it, we get a bit of a sense. And I think that's Tony, Tony and our, our data team are working on that part where we, you know, you answer a few questions about your existing background, your income, and we, we basically make a recommendation about what kind of portfolio you should start with. And for some people who are very experienced, when we, when we design that portfolio for you, you can then say, oh, well, I want something more aggressive or less aggressive because you know, but for most beginners, go, going with that recommended portfolio starts you on that journey. And then over time, you can start customizing based on what you understand your needs um, are. So again, that's another improvement that we've made um, and that we're going to roll out over time. But for now, we just say that um, most, as long as you understand that most investments come with some risk, um, even the relatively safe Eurobonds has its own risk profile, and therefore you are comfortable enough with some level of risk. Um, then you should just you will be safe with either asset class, to be honest. Um, how do I, as a client, suggest the stocks uh, we want you to invest in? E.g., tech, agribusiness, pharma, or does Rise make make those financial decisions for me? What we do so, so <laughs> <laughs> we have we are like Tony Tony described our process. So again, we 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 think about it like if people send us a lot of stuff because if we make it possible for someone to send us 
stock suggestions, um, we are not going to, so it, it becomes almost noise in the sense that, and I use noise in a very, very um, defined way, which is a lot of information that does not allow us to see clearly what we want to pick and the ones we don't want to pick. So imagine we have um, 30,000 users sending us new stock recommendations every day. There's always going to be a part of us that will want to start looking at those stocks. And, but we already have a process that surfaces objectively well um, defined and very good prospects from our, for our stocks portfolio. So adding that feature would then, you know, make things a little bit trickier. So for now, we just ask that you trust that we have a rigorous process, a very objective process, and we take a lot of time to make sure that the quality of every single investment that goes into our app um, is something you can have a lot of confidence in. And so we will continue to just make that selection. You know, tomorrow things might change. We might also roll out a product that allows users to design and customize their own portfolio. Um, but as of today, um, we, we, we still make that decision. Um, there's a few of these. I'm going to ask them as one. Uh, summary is basically how soon is it possible to get paid in dollars, uh, to get payouts in dollars? Um, I can answer that. Um, so firstly, there's a reason why we can't pay out in dollars right now, right? So um, the CBN, in an effort to stave off um, pressures on the Naira, issued like a circular that was um, sometime in April um, 2015. And the circular basically reiterated the government's stance with respect to pricing, you know, local transactions in dollar or any other foreign currency for that matter. And in that circular, it basically reminded Nigerians that um, if you carry out any transaction and like price that transaction in a foreign currency, yeah, they are basically flouting um, a CBN's act. So, so I think I read that um, a while ago. I think that was some sections, I'm not a lawyer, but section like 15 and 20 or something like that, uh, which basically states that the unit of currency in Nigeria is the Naira, right? So we can't possibly pay you out in dollars. If we pay out in dollars, we'll be contravening that um, act or law or whatever, right? So um, that's, that's essentially why. They only gave concessions for people that operate in the maritime sector, um, sector um, um, oil and gas, and you know people that operate or have businesses in those free trade zones. So um, that's why we, we we currently don't have a BDC license, so mm -hmm. we, we can't we are not licensed to to do that for now. For now, we're, we're working on that. Yeah. The, the, the caveat there though is if certain categories of users. Um, yeah. Fund um, directly in dollars. Who sends us? So if you send us dollars off the app, um, and usually it's usually maybe you're, you're trying to send in a, a pretty significant amount, and it's not something we can process through our app. So because you sent it out to us in dollars, we're able to send it back to you in dollars, right? But those are special yeah. cases. For the exactly. vast majority of our users, we're going to retain the ability to fund and exit in Naira. For regulatory reasons. Yeah. For, now. for now. For now. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, is the stock portfolio going to change? And if it does, what could trigger the change? So, um, what what triggers new? So let's let me use a, a pretty a pretty uh, recent example. So a company like Boeing. Um, Based on all the evaluation, Boeing was a very strong contender for long-term returns, management, everything, right? Um, that was until the MAX 737 debacle, and then how they managed that, and then the post-regulatory effects of that basically broke down the thesis for Boeing, right? So um, a company like Boeing would definitely go from, oh, yeah, it will make it into Rice portfolio to maybe now it won't. So um, in that sense, if any company that is currently in our portfolio, um, either their thesis breaks down in a very significant way or um, something changes in a macro environment where they are no longer, um, basically the assumptions that went into selecting them no longer hold up. Um, also, 
when we when we want to evaluate to add a stock to the portfolio we also evaluate those who aren't really performing up to expectations and then would we'll remove one um, out of the portfolio because if you look at um portfolio theory will tell you that you have you achieve maximum diversification this also answers the question for the person talking about broad market exposure beyond one stock think about rise itself as an index so if you look at portfolio theory having about 20 different stocks 20 to 30 different stocks gives you maximum diversification and therefore what we want to do is when we want to add new positions, we'll also evaluate some of the existing positions and say, all right, should we still keep this? Is it doing what we wanted it to do? Is the thesis still intact? If not, we would remove that and replace it with a new one. So those are the way. But other than that, the turnover on our stocks tend to be very, very low. So um, someone wants, Olaide wants more clarity about um, returns. So his question or her question is, it's not clear after you invest when you get returns on your investments. You get it at the point of investment. It allows you to select the intervals, but once you have invested, it shows you that you only get returns after one year. And uh, I, will, I will say something about that. So I'm not sure what she meant or he meant by, uh, by um, returns after one year. So the way it, 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 that we have it is that for euro bonds, returns are, are daily. So um, when you invest, uh, for, and you select a particular duration, so we start re giving you returns every single day until the, the, the plan matures, which you know, if you have auto um, auto reinvest set up, is going to you know mature into a new plan and then the, a new cycle just starts and if you don't have that set or then it's going to be withdrawn into your um wallet so for euro burns you have daily returns for for stocks as well you have market day returns so for days where there is a um, market activity you have returns at the end of the day for days where there are holidays and there are no market um, activities, you don't get returns. And for, for real estate, the returns are currently monthly. Yeah. Um, okay. Does anybody else want to add anything to that? No? Okay. Is it safe to leave funds in my wallet balance? Absolutely. Yeah, it is safe to leave wallet, uh, to leave my uh, <laughs> funds in a wallet, but we... Oh we kind of don't encourage it because we're just keeping the money there. Why can't you just put it in a plan and let it work for you? Absolutely. That's better than I can ever amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, these two, I'm going to ask as one, they're kind of in the same category. Uh, can the stocks invested in be made available to users in the app? not just generic or a summary, the actual stocks invested in. And the second one, which is basically the same, can you tell us the companies in your portfolio? Mm. So the, the, to answer those two questions, when you, set up, when you want to set, set up the stock plan, um, you're, you're able to see all the stocks that are in our portfolio. Um, the only challenge is that you don't see real time, you don't see that information in real time once you're actually a user. Um, and it's, again, we're, we're going to make it possible in, in version two for you to go to a portfolio tab and see the list of your stocks in the, in the portfolio and their performance, right? Um, however, are we going to be able to make it available, make each stock available to the users um, that we buy for them? Um, no. Um, and there's a very simple reason why we can't. So the way we hold the 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 stocks is essentially at the portfolio level. So think about a think about a mutual fund or think about any 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 index like of, of the kind that we have, right? So the funds are held at the organizational level where you know you you know how much you contributed to the portfolio, you know the performance of the portfolio, you know the holdings of the portfolio, but we can't translate that directly into your own direct holdings, right? So because they are in the fund managers um, they are held at the fund manager level. They have tax implications for held, being held that way. Um, they have like custodial implications for being held that way. Um, so if we made it available directly to you, would become by extension a brokerage app, um, which is not 
what rice is building, right? So that that limits how we can like, the availability of those thoughts to you. So that's what that's why the answer is no. Thank you. Um, will there be an opportunity to fund plans with cryptocurrencies? B. <laughs> yes. Um, in the future, so we are working on um, having crypto integrated into the app. Awesome. Yeah. So look, 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 look forward to to having that in the app. Uh, do we plan on having a web version? Yes. We do. It's it's all in the works. Yeah. So um, you know, like I said earlier, uh, when I meant, when I talked about the process, it's um, you know agile. We we pick the most important things first, and then make sure that we deliver it to the to the to the users. So when it gets to the turn of having a web portal um, readily available for people, yes, we are going to um, launch that so that you don't have to like um, go on the app to access your account. You can. Anywhere you are, as long as you have access to the internet on any computer, you can always access your um, your account. Awesome. And to add awesome. color to that, we 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 thought about building a web version. Um, actually, it would it would it would be out by now. Um, but then we we looked at the data, um, and again, that tells you like there's a combined um, approach to our decisions where we look at the data, look at what we're building, and then look at our strategic needs and come to some kind of um, clarity on what to do next. So we looked at all the data from our users and the things that are missing in the current app. And we realized that building the web version of this current app before trying to build a version two with all those improvements um, wouldn't be the best approach, right? So we want to rebuild the app first, incorporate all the changes that we know users have asked for. That way, when we then build the, the web version, we're building the web version of the final result of that process. So, that's another thing to, to think about. That's another reason why we said, all right, we're gonna launch version two first. We'll make all the incremental improvements to version one, build version two, and then launch the web version of version two after that. So it's, it's gonna be an exciting next few months for our users, for sure. Um, there are a few of these, I'm gonna ask them as one. Can payments be made, can payments and withdrawals be made into Nigerian uh, dumb accounts, dollar accounts. Huh. That's, that's yes and no. It's not on the app right now. Um, I think some of the conversations we've had with our payment providers suggest that that's possible. But again, we have to think about both the cost of that. Um, it seems very expensive. And also, there's, there's a lot of moving parts to it. Um, <laughs> but it's possible. So let's we, we can't definitely settle on one side. It's still something that we're in the process of, of figuring out. Um, so just keep, keep up to uh, uh, check, back in, check back with us on that. I think that's the best thing we can say there. Okay. Um, so there are a few questions about real estate. Uh, how does it work, essentially? Um, so the... The simplest way to think about it is that um, we, we essentially get properties, um, slice them into small units that make it possible for people to then come in and purchase ownership, right? Little bits of ownership in a broad property portfolio. And then you get the benefit of the monthly rental cash flow in that, from that portfolio, as well as the capital gains from the properties in that portfolio. So it's almost like an index of real estate properties or um, uh, a real estate investment trust. So it reads, diced into like small units that users then come in and buy. Um, so we, the reason we've made it that way is because we really think about how do we make this asset class accessible to most people? So there are people who can afford to, you know, they'll come to the US, they'll buy properties, they'll get the rents from that, they'll get the capital gains from that. And they have their money making, you know, parked in dollars. But for the vast majority of people, um, it's a bit out of reach to say do $100,000 or $200,000 worth of property purchase. And therefore we purchase these properties and then dice it up into small amounts that our users can then get access to. Awesome. Um, Tia Makra has asked a couple times, read that the US, is, US Fed is pumping cash on the stock market. Um, how true is this and what is the implication on Rise Fest? Um, 
the the yes it's true um the u.s fed is essentially holding up the market um i think when people say making it perform better than what it's supposed to um i think that's a bit subjective and i'll, I'll go into a little bit of detail why I'm, i hope i don't lose anyone but if you think about why stocks are down today or why people expect stocks to be down it's because of a temporary halt in economic activity due to the pandemic right so what the U.S. Fed is doing is we want to bring the, the, the economy is like a machine. So when transactions, normally there are people who have to, you know, when you want to sell, there's someone who is buying. When you want to buy, there's someone who is selling. And that keeps the economy pumping. Now, because everyone is basically at, at a pause, um, the Fed is supporting what is essentially lost demand by making those purchases themselves. Um, so over time, as the economy re re starts back up, um, I expect that the Fed would then draw down their participation and the stocks will continue to, to manage as usual, right? So um, in the sense, and as far as how does it impact the rise, um, like every other fund manager, we have to account for that, right? So, but we not only account for the Fed's actions, we're not counting on the Fed to continue to boost the value of our portfolio. What we count on is these stocks will eventually ride out this pandemic and continue to make, make money over time and so as long as we keep our eyes on the long term, we can ignore the short-term fluctuations of the market or the short-term actions of the Fed. And so that's, those are just the macro environmental issues that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis as we manage your investments. Um, Dr. K has a question. He says the CBN governor has said they will be unification of the exchange rate. What is the implication of this? not a lot to be honest um because for for the users it means that if they unify all the exchange rates um they're usually going to find some middle ground at the balance where all right this is the official exchange rate across the board um but again we 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 look at from a structural perspective as a user um where should you have your assets over the long term right so yes have some investments in there but also allocate some of your investments for dollar assets and it definitely get access to investments that are global in nature. It acts like as a balance and as a hedge, right? So um, regardless of what the rates are today, um, that's not what drives what your investment um, action should be, right? So it's about the long, <clears throat> excuse me, it's about the long-term growth of your wealth over time. And so um, short-term rate action, short-term like merging this or, if those things are just they are they are they are things that you can safely ignore and think about where you know for instance if i want to think about where um the rates were in 2005 or for someone trying to decide on what to invest in um, whether they merge the rates or not in 2000 doesn't mean that the structural issues um and the structural limitations of only doing your investments in naira um, didn't go away because of the rates, right? So um, thinking about that makes you know that regardless of what the CBN does, um, and which I think is a good thing, by the way, um, you should still have some exposure to global investments and dollar-denominated investments. Uh, sticking with rates, so talking about the rate of return at the maturity date, which rate would be applicable if I don't want to reinvest at the time? We have invested at 440 to one, Will the prevailing rate and maturity date be used? Yes, that's that's essentially what we use. Prevailing dates at the day of withdrawal. Um, Mel wants to know: Is there a way to waive hitting charges, pay stack fees when adding funds to any plans, or at least display it? I was about to, you know, answer that in the chat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you just pick it up. All right, yeah, so there is a change that is coming in the next build that shows the user um, the breakdown of the approximate expected processing fee from the um, third party uh, payment processor. So, so that you get to see it, you, you, you can see how much you will be charged before proceeding with, um, with the payment. Yeah, so look out for that in the next build. We, we are running that out soon. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, we have quite a few questions that we will try to answer after, maybe put it up on the website with answers. 
Um, we're going to take a couple more. However, we will be wrapping up. Uh, someone wants to know what the CEO, CTO, and I guess the CEO does. Um, yeah. Who wants to go first? <laughs> CEO, how about you start us off? So, so yeah, um, I think that uh, for, for, for uh, my role, what do I do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, ultimate responsibility about our vision, right? Rest, rests with me um, and uh, whoever else will gonna, is going to occupy the, the role of the C CEO in the future. Um, the goal is, or your job is to um, make sure that we are articulating and clearly um, building towards a very clear vision and that we select a team that both understands that vision and has the ability to deliver on it. So, um, and then certain business strategy in, 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 in concert or with discussion with other parts of the company and say, okay, this is what we can do on the product side, this is what we can do on the marketing side, putting all that together and make sure that we're aligning it with the vision. Um, I think that is the key role that, that I um, occupy as the CEO. Um, I, I do also have decision making um, about the, the products or the, the investments that go into the product. But I think that's, that's attached to the fact that we have to be building towards a certain vision. So, yeah. Yeah, let me just go next. Um, after we have um, articulated that vision, right, um, my role as the COO is to um, distill that into um, quarterly objectives and make sure that every member of our team is um, like understands what they need to do for a time, right? And we're driving towards that and make sure that, you know, there's no cog in the wheel, as I explained earlier, you know, that runs right and everything is running smoothly and, you know, uh, we're operationally efficient across all um, sectors of um, our respective teams. And um, me as a CTO, actually CTO means Chief Technology Officer. <laughs> yeah, so I just oversee the, um, the engineering team. That, everything that has to do with product development, decision around um, technical things, basically trans transforming the business idea into you know, um, technology solutions, that's, that's what I do. And I just transform everything, break it down into, you know, um, things that developers can understand and you know, implement right off the bat. And yeah, so that's basically what I do. And in the future, and if, if the, that's basically what CTO does. Um, they, they just sit on top of, you know, engineering, all the, <laughs> all the you know, server here products is crashing. This is happening, the CTO basically, you know, at least for, for, for startups, definitely, um, they, they, they are in the mix of, um, you know, all the things that have to do with technology. But they're the ones that get the, the least sleep. <laughs> <laughs> actually, we are, we, are, we are a very underslept bunch, I think, across the board. But um, I think to, to add color to, to what everybody's answer has also been, so think about the fact that you users engage with our product to, through an app, right? Engage with our value proposition through an app as a technology company. Um, so that app would not exist without our CTO, managing it, building it, um, selecting more engineers to expand on it, right? Um, and then we wouldn't be able to run our team efficiently without the operator. And then um, in our case, articulating and making sure that we are expanding on our vision um, falls on my shoulder. So it's kind of like a concerted effort. Um, but beyond the three of us, I, and that's, that's something I also wanted to point out. So we have other members of the team um, who make sure, so there's, there's, there's Otaz who, who is on the call, um, there's Efe, there's Mona um, and uh, Awa, a number of other people that are all helping support what we're doing, whether through marketing, whether through making sure that our internal culture, our administrative um, responsibilities and everything else is being done in a very efficient way. Um, and that, you know, we are thinking about always what's the next thing that needs to be done. Um, and also managing very strongly. I think 
Um, our next time we're going to do a more or less, a, the next, our next office hours will be more like a meet the team um, because we have designers who, who help translate what we want to build into like a very clean interface. We have a customer service who will take requests, take calls, make sure users are happy, engage with, with our users on different channels and just make sure that we're being as responsive as we need to be. And so um, putting it all together, I think that um, for us to be able to deliver on everything that we do, um, we, we, we try to make sure that we, we, we think about what we do at a team level and everybody contributes towards everything that we do. All right. Um, Sorry, um, there's some yard work going on, I guess. Um, we have a few more minutes, so we're just going to take one or two more questions and um, can I know what is the least period of every plan and what is the share of the ROI? Hmm. So the minimum, the minimum period is three months. Um, and the ROI that we set on the app or that we give you when you're set up is essentially like an expected return, um, which means that sometimes it can be higher. And um, for Eurobonds, it's fixed anyway, but for the other plans, it could be higher. Um, in some cases, it might be lower, but um, the vast majority of the time, all the returns that you make on the app belongs to you as the user. Um, and so we don't, we don't say, oh, this is the return you are making. We're, like we try not to make it sound like that. Um, what we're saying is if you invest in this type of asset, that's what you can expect um, to, to see over the long term. So, um, and, uh, to take Do we plan? Oh. There's I'm a question sorry? about investing in Asian markets. Yeah, that was um, my next yes. question. Yes, we we actually plan um, and we're looking at how to integrate that into the app because we're going to put that in a separate category. Um, so it's either going to be a selection of Asian stocks or other asset classes that are concentrated around the Asian region. But yes, that's something we can expect to see on our app. Um, why do you have different amounts for when I invest and when I want to sell? For instance, I buy at 440, while you sell at 425. Bossu, um, yeah, so, so basically that's just the way, you know, currency exchange works. Right. Um, so the, uh, the, the, price, the rate at which you buy is different from the rate at which you sell. So essentially, when, when you're, you are funding your accounts in Naira, you're telling us that you want to sell Naira and buy dollars. And when you withdraw, automatically you're telling us that you want to sell your dollars to buy Naira. So the difference is the, just the spread. is how market works, if you understand um, Forex. And basically, let's, let's just use the, the Domao Aboki um, broader change person that you just go, if you, if, you, if you sell dollar to them right now, the rate they will sell to you, uh, the, the, way they will, the rate they will buy the dollar from you will be lower than the rate actually they will sell the dollar to you. So basically, it's just how, how the um, exchange rate market right. works. And I want to add that, Rise, we don't set these rates. We receive them from third parties, um, and and it's also the reason why they tend to move around, depending on what dollar is selling for on the the street, right? So um, we don't have control over the rates. Um, we have to always set the rates based on what we know we are going to receive once you fund your accounts. Um, and so, I think it's been a solid interaction. Yeah, we've gotten over a hundred questions and you guys are amazing. Um, <laughs> but we are going to call it a day now. Uh, yeah, so I, I do want to say this um, just for the, sake, for the sake of um, our users and um, future office hours that we're going to hold. The reason that we do these things, the reason that I want to have opportunities like this to really interact with our users is one, so that you see the people behind the product that you're engaging with, but also too, because we like to see how you're thinking about your 
investments, how you're thinking about our products, and how best we can tackle and add additional solutions that would really do the job for you. And so we, we thank you guys for engaging with us and asking all the questions. And it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, yeah, and you can always ask more questions to our email, hello at rise.capital. And um, thank you so much. Or, you guys have all been amazing. Been really great or, questions. Sorry, or on our Telegram, and uh, yes. we have a bunch of users there. So just hop on, you know, who are always there to ask you questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, and thank you, guys.